So this fall, we are talking about skepticism and doubt. Last week, Paul started off this sermon series for us, and at the end of his sermon, he invited everyone to write down a question or a doubt that they had. Now, if you were wondering if you were the only one, the only one with questions or doubts, the good news is this. You are not alone. As a church, we have got a healthy dose of doubt and a lot of good, hard questions. Here's just a sampling of what the people sitting next to you said they had doubts about or questioned. What about people who are not Christian? Do Christians have to, quote, save them? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Another person wrote, as science advances, I find that I have to continually reground slash redefine my faith to determine what is or isn't important to believe. Someone else wrote, the power of my prayers. If prayers aren't answered, then what? Is there really a heaven and hell? I have trouble with miracles. I want to figure out how they could logically happen and not depend on faith. And the list goes on. There were probably 60 or 70 questions or doubts that were written down, and they are still coming in. Basically, we have decided to turn this six-week series into a 60-week one. Okay, I'm kidding, but maybe not. One person submitted a number of good, hard questions by email to Paul and myself. Paul responded saying we'd make sure to answer them all. The person responded, I don't want answers. I want more questions. And that's the hope, that through this series we not only find some tentative answers together, but more importantly, we find new, deeper, broader questions to ask. Of all the questions that were submitted, there was one that kept coming up, a reoccurring one. And it was, what do we do with this? What do we do with the Bible? How are we supposed to make sense of passages that talk about miracles, creation in seven days, sea monsters, and giants? As one person wrote, I have a hard time believing stories in the Bible are true. Another person asked, what's from humans and what's from God? We are going to look at some of the questions around scripture today. And to do that, we're going to start with a story that I bet most of you know. It's the story of Noah's Ark. Raise your hand if you've heard this story before. Excellent. Great. So most of us, it's a familiar story. It's one that is often told in Sunday school classes to children. And it's so famous and beloved that it's actually often used on the cover for children's Bibles see a couple examples here. So this is a familiar story to us, so let's tell it. How does it go? I'll get us started. There was a man named Noah who lived a long time ago. How does the story go? So there was a man who lived, and what did God tell this man to do? To build an ark, right? And when he started building the ark, did people get on board? No. Yeah, people gave him a really hard time. They thought he was crazy, but Noah was obedient to God, so he kept building the ark. And why was he building this ark? A flood was coming, right? So God said, there's this big flood gonna come, that's going to come, so you need to start building this ark. Um, and so God said, you know, Noah, I want to have you take you and your family. Um, but he also had a couple of other uh, creatures. How many creatures did he want? How many, how many of each? two of each. So two of each of the animals, God said, take your family and these animals and get on the ark. So he got on the ark and it started to rain. How long did it rain for? Yep, 40 days and 40 nights. You guys are all getting flying colors right now. This is great. So it rained and it rained and then it stopped raining. And Noah was wondering, is it safe to get off the boat? So what did he do? He sent a dove out, right? And the dove flew and uh, he sent it out again and it brought back an olive branch, right? And then he sent it out a third time and it didn't come back. So Noah said, okay, it's probably safe for me to get off the boat. It's dry now. 
And then God um, knows off the boat. God said, you know, I'm not going to do that again. And as a way to remind you of my, my promise, I'm going to do what? What symbol was given? A rainbow in the sky. Excellent. Is that how folks remember it, right? Excellent. I think we're doing pretty well here. Miss Shirley would be very, very proud. <laughs> now, as you remember back to Sunday school, what were some of the things that you remember the story trying to teach you? What were some of the moral lessons? God keeps promises. Yep, that God talks to you. Maybe some folks heard... Um, that it's important to be obedient to God or to not go with the crowd, but to do what's right and do what God tells you to do, even when it's hard. Other lessons might be be a good person, obey God. God will keep us safe. God loves us. So when I was little, uh, my family attended a Methodist church. And in the nursery room, there was this beautiful mural on the wall of the animals in the ark. In fact, it was so beautiful that one year my family took our Christmas photo in front of it. In Sunday school, I read this story, the version we just told, and at a Presbyterian camp, much like Heartland Camp, I sang it about it. Does anyone here know the Arky Arky song? <laughs> a couple of folks. Okay, maybe it's a New York thing, but yeah, there's a song that goes, the Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody, the Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody, get those children out of the muddy, muddy children of the Lord. All right, and we could keep going. There's many verses, right? But we learn this. This is one of those stories that we tell not just to adults, but to children, often very, very young children, myself included, which is good. It is good to help children get familiar with Bible stories and characters in the Bible. But the problem is that after elementary school, and definitely after confirmation, most of us, myself included, stop attending Sunday school. And we stop reading the Bible even more. And this leaves us with a Disney version, or perhaps more appropriately, the VeggieTales version of most Bible stories. I know this was the case for me. It wasn't until I was 24 years old and in seminary that I encountered this Bible story again. And when I went back to it, I found that the words on the page didn't match the cute animal cartoons I saw in my head and the fun sing-along lyrics that I had learned at camp. When I reread this story, I realized that this is a really hard text. It's one that raises more questions than it answers. And as I read through it in seminary, I kept thinking, why would you ever tell this story to children? Or at least not put a warning label on it. There's violence and corruption and evil among humanity. There's mass genocide. God decides to wipe out every living thing that breathes on the face of the earth, except for Noah and his family and a pair of each of the animals. And, the, and then God just says, well, I'll never do that again. <laughs> what are we supposed to do with this story? Why is it in the Bible? And what is it trying to tell us, to teach us? At second, we don't take scripture, or we take scripture seriously, but we don't take it literally. The Bible, our scripture as Christians, it's made up of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And the Bible really isn't so much a library of books as it is a collection of oral stories, letters, and accounts that were written down and edited over time. Different parts of the Bible were written by different people in different communities at different points throughout history. Most of the biblical texts were written or referred to events that happened 2,000 to 3,500 years ago. Within the Bible, there are lots of different kinds of literature. There's parables and prophecy, poetry and prayers, letters and history, miracle stories, and more. The flood story, the story that we often refer to as Noah's Ark, it's part of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and it's found in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapters 6 through 9. It's not a historical account of literal event, although some Christians may interpret it that way. Rather, at least in my reading of the text, it's an etiology. 
An etiology is the investigation or attribution of the cause or reason for something, often expressed in terms of historical or mythical explanation. Etiologies are stories, often with mythical attributes, that seek to explain why something exists or why something happened. The story of the Great Flood, I believe, in, is in part an etiology that is meant to explain the origin of rainbows. But it's also more than that. It's a text that invites us to enter into it and ask hard questions about God, humanity, our relationships with one another, and how we are called to live in the world. Now, my guess is that I am not the only one who hasn't taken a good, hard look at this text since Sunday school. So I'm going to invite you to join me in doing so today. So if you would, please pull out those blue books, those Bibles in your pews, and turn to page 6. The flood story begins in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and goes through uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 17. And it is a very long passage. So we're not going to read all of it out loud today, but I invite you to do, do so on your own sometime this week. So again, it's Genesis 6, verse 5, and a little context for this passage. At this point in Genesis, the earth is filled with lots and lots and lots of people, the descendants of Adam and Eve and their children. And the story begins here in Genesis 6, 5, where it states, the Lord saw. Is this working? Can you guys hear that? Yeah, okay. The Lord saw that humanity had become thoroughly evil on the earth and that every idea their minds thought up was always completely evil. The Lord regretted making human beings on the earth and he was heartbroken. The Lord said, I will wipe off the land, the human race that I've created, from human beings to livestock to the crawling things, to the birds in the skies, because I regret I ever made them. But as for Noah, the Lord approved of him. Noah was a moral and exemplary man. He walked with God. And then moving to verse 13, God tells Noah what he's going to do and also what Noah's supposed to do. So God said to Noah, the end has come for all creatures since they have filled the earth with violence. I am now about to destroy them along with the earth, so make a wooden ark. God goes on to tell Noah he's going to make a covenant with him and his family, and he gives him very specific instructions for making the ark. And then God also gives him those instructions about the animals. You'll notice, though, that at the end of chapter 7, God says, bring two of every animal onto the ark. But then right at the beginning of chapter 8, Noah's told something else. He's told, bring seven of the clean animals and the birds. So we've got a little bit of an inconsistency there. Noah and his family and the animals get on the boat. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights, causing a huge flood. And the scripture says, every creature took its last breath. God remembers Noah and his family and causes the waters to recede. And then around uh, chapter 8, verse 7, Noah sends out two birds. First, a raven and then a dove, and when the dove doesn't come back, Noah and his family and the animals get off the boat. Uh, Noah makes a sacrifice to God, and God decides to never destroy all living things that breathe again. God then makes a covenant with Noah and his family and all living things, and as it says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 8, God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I am now setting up my covenant with you, with your descendants, and with every living being with you, with the birds, with the large animals, and with all the animals of the earth. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be a symbol of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember the covenant between me and you and every living being among all the creatures. Floodwaters will never again destroy all creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Now, you may be wondering, so what's different about this in the children's version? Okay, the number of animals, why does that matter? What, why does it matter that there's a difference there? But a couple of key things to note. 
Children's Bibles are notorious for often taking complex, morally ambiguous stories and turning them into simplistic morality tales. For example, one of the lessons that I was taught about this story growing up was that Noah was obedient to God and did the right, and did the right thing even when others were making fun of him. The story I was told was about having the courage to not go along with the crowd, but to do what is right even when it's hard and it means getting made fun of. Now, there is nothing wrong with that teaching, except for it isn't in the story. At no point in the biblical text does it say that people were making fun of Noah as he made the ark, or that he managed to do the right thing even when others thought he was crazy. In fact, the Bible doesn't mention other people noticing him or talking to him about the ark at all. Or in many Bible stories, Noah is often lifted up as a hero of the faith, a moral exemplar, a righteous man who obeys God, which, again, is good. It's good for children and for all of us to have uh, role models. However, when we only tell about Noah as righteous and faithful, we turn Noah into a one-dimensional character. And we teach kids and ourselves that people of faith are to be put on pedestals that they're different than us. You see, what's not often included in children's Bible stories about Noah is that after the flood, Noah planted a very large vineyard and then got drunk off of all the wine. So drunk, in fact, that he took off all his clothes. Now, this may not be a sin, but it definitely makes Noah a little more human, a little more relatable, perhaps, a little less righteous. And in truth, a lot of stories in the Bible are about God using the underdog, the morally ambiguous person, the sinner, not the saint, the one who doesn't have it all together to do God's work. There are a lot of questions. We could ask about how the version of this story many of us were taught as children varies from the actual story that's in the Bible. But the biblical itself, the text itself, also raises a lot of really good questions. Now, we are a Western post-Enlightenment people. Many of us have been taught to engage texts very critically. We've been taught to interrogate texts and to look for truth and clarity and explanations when we read. When we read Bible stories like the flood story or the creation story or even miracle stories in the Bible, we often try to deconstruct them and ask questions like, how could this have really happened? What's the scientific explanation? Or what was the original intention of this text? How did the first audience hear it? What is its true meaning? Now, these are good questions to ask, but it may not be that this is the best approach to the Bible. The Bible is not a Western post-Enlightenment text. It's an ancient Near, Near Eastern text that was written thousands of years ago. It contains stories that came out of an oral storytelling tradition and that were later written down. And many of these stories, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, were not meant to provide simple moral lessons or answers about God and humanity and life. Stories in the Hebrew scriptures were meant to poke and prod listeners, to invoke imagination, and to invite communities to come together to make meaning for themselves from the stories that they heard. You see, in Hebrew literature, a common literary technique was to leave gaps, to leave spaces in the text. For example, in the story of Noah, nowhere does it tell us what Noah was thinking. There's a gap there that we're invited into. We're not told when God was speaking to him, when God said he was going to destroy all living things of the flood, when God told him to build a huge boat, what Noah thought. This gap in the text allows us to fill it in with our own imaginations. Some of us may think that Noah was scared or nervous. Some may think that Noah was mostly grateful Grateful he and his family were going to be safe. 
Others may think that he was skeptical and that he doubted God. Or maybe he thought all of these things and more. Putting gaps in stories allowed ancient listeners and allows us as contemporary readers to be more actively involved in the story. And this means that when we read a story like Noah's Ark, you and I, we can fill in the gaps in different ways. It also means that stories can speak to us differently and teach us different and multiple lessons at the same time. Stories in the Bible like this were not meant to be scientific explanations or morality tales. They were meant to spark questions and conversation. They were meant to engage people's hearts and imaginations, and hopefully their lives. Now take a second to think about this, to, to really think about this. The Bible, our scripture, not as a place for answers or explanations, but the Bible is a place for imagination, for wondering and asking questions together. It's a different way to approach scripture, and it may be new to you, but this practice is actually very, very old. Midrash is an interpretive practice in the Jewish tradition. Vanessa Lovelace describes Midrash, Midrash as, quote, a Jewish mode of interpretation that not only engages the words of the text, behind the text and beyond the text, but also focuses on each letter, the words left unsaid by each line. In the practice of Midrash, you look at what has been left out. You read between the lines, you use your imagination and experience as a community to explore the gaps that have been intentionally included in scripture. As Hebrew scholar Will Gaffney notes, Midrash, quote, asks questions of the text. Sometimes it provides answers, but sometimes it leaves the reader to answer the questions. In the story of the great flood, the story of Noah's Ark, there are a lot of gaps in the text. Spaces for us to imagine and to read between the lines, to engage in conversation and to listen to how the Spirit is speaking to us today. Gaps that invite us to imagine. How would this story be different if it were told from the perspective of Noah's wife or children? or even harder yet, from the perspective of a person or animal who is not on the boat. Gaps that invite us to ask, why didn't Noah advocate for the other people? Why didn't he use his power and privilege, his relationship with God to try and help them too? Was it because he and his family were safe and that's what mattered most? Are there times that I choose not to use my power and privilege to advocate for others? When I put the emphasis on playing it safe and choose not to rock the boat? Or how about this? God destroys every living thing that breathes because of humanity's evil, violence, and corruption. When we read this story in the context of our current human-made ecological crisis, I wonder what this text has to teach us. Perhaps it's that our actions as humans can have devastating consequences for the rest of creation. The flood story offers an explanation of where rainbows come from. But beyond that, it doesn't give a lot of answers. Rather, it raises a lot of questions. And it asks us to be willing to go into those gaps. And that's the thing. Scripture is not an answer book. It's a living document that's meant to help us to ask questions and seek meaning. And this wondering, this doubting, this discovering and discussing done in community, that's what allows us to hear the Spirit of God speaking to us today. God is not in the words on the page. God is in the gaps. Now, as a pastor, I'll be honest. There are times that I want to say God equals answers, in part because people think it's my job to know what the answers are and what God says about it. But when I take time to stop and think about this, I know that's not right, that because that's not what our faith is about. Our faith is not about having the right answers it's about learning how to ask the right questions, 
which is what scripture calls us to do time and time again. Scripture doesn't give us easy answers. It asks us to ask, or to ask the hard questions, questions like, who is my neighbor? What does the Lord require of me? And Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Scripture calls us to ask these questions not only with our minds, but with our hearts and lives. To paraphrase the poet Rainier Marie Rilke, Scripture invites us to live the question so that over time, we might gradually, eventually, without even noticing it, live our way into the answer. Friends, may it be so. Amen.